and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McMenamin. On this show, Zed from Zed Real Estate and his journey to success. Our panel discusses more buyers versus sellers part two. But first, Alan Oy is the construction coach, which is about people and their potential. Alan Oy, welcome to the new property show. Pleasure to have you. Likewise, I've only seen your presence online. You were speaking about the power of branding and yours is an exceptional one and it continues to grow. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. It's, uh, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. Uh, and in this case, um, you're well known in the industry, you're known as the construction coach. Now, initially I thought you were coaching clients, but you're coaching mindset, success, branding. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on what you do? Of course, as Australia's first construction coach, similar to the principle of branding, it's finding a world where you can marry both who you are, the expertise that you want to bring to the industry, and also the impact that you want to create. And having worked on construction sites, I hung up my boots for Louboutins quite some time ago, mm -hmm. but I realized that there was a gaping chasm in the development of people within the industry. It's a sensational industry. You've been in property, construction, architecture, they're all so closely intertwined. But so much opportunity was continuously left on the table because people weren't seeing that and even if they did see any sort of opportunity they carried so much reservation because the status quo of the industry is so domineering that people are scared to break out of that and when I saw the opportunity to a break out of that you have to become the person if you can't see who that is and lead the way and show people that you can have a completely different career within the industry that is not set in 1965 and for some reason you're still carrying out this archaic narrative which has nothing to do with you but allows you to be in full expression of yourself. So marrying what is traditional construction in terms of the industry and the knowledge, bringing in the self into that conversation and allowing people to have both the industry and the people within as their canvas. Because typical building construction is not for everyone and there is so much opportunity within the industry. So four and a half years, three books later, podcasts, so on and so forth, it's been a fantastic journey and, and more happening. And I think what you talk about there, the word I hear is self. Um, you've become... Uh, well, obviously, early on, Nightingale, but you become what you think about. Um, so with that said, what you've done is, and I, and I also capulate on the word canvas, you've painted a new picture and you've said to people, this is what you can do and here I am doing it. Uh, you're practising what you preach and you're inspiring others because I, I understand you've got some high-profile clients as well that you deal with and some of these people are going to say, what's a female doing? <laughs> in the industry telling me what I need to know about construction. And one thing that uh, I, I pick up about you, apart from your style, your, uh, your speech, is your ability to see through the BS and actually identify its mindset. That's where the deals are done. So with success being that key undertone for um, driving the forefront, how do you help people transform? I want to touch on an interesting word that you said, and that is narrative mm -hmm. and the BS that is embedded into that. Mm -hmm. You can dissect any common narrative, whether it's gender or you can't buy property for whatever example because the generations before you didn't. If someone truly sat down and dissected common narratives that are falsely being propagated, they'll find that they are all wrong and they only mislead people, not allow them to be, excuse me, be expansive or get to greater horizons. And the gender narrative is the first one that I had to put down because fundamentally it has nothing to do with a person's ability to succeed on their own terms. Because as you correctly pointed out, what you think about is what you actually get to experience in reality. And people in building construction know this really well. They go through the process of planning, of putting in the brief when you want to have a property. They know the process so well, then you need to finance it the, the facade, there's so many aspects that they're so versed, well versed with when it comes to building. But then when they have to apply the same principles 
of building construction to their life, they have no idea what to do because no one's telling them what to do. And if you look around most of the industry, where are people getting their ideas from? Other mediocre people who are also going nowhere, with all due respect, they can, but they don't carry any vision. So being able to bring that into A, for myself, and then B, bringing that to others and showing them that you already have everything that you need, but if you're not taking a principle-centric approach to your career and your life, you will only go with the flow, and the flow can only go downhill. And that principle-based approach is also the focus of my fourth book. Leading into the fourth book. Um, how convenient. So... The fourth book, and there's a wealth of knowledge there, but I, I think what, what I'm seeing also there too, before we uh, enter into that, is you can't learn how to cook by going to barbecues. You need to be hanging out with the master chefs, the Gordon Ramsays. Uh, and essentially, you've separated yourself, you put yourself out on the limb, and so much so that you've written down what you've thought about. The name of the fourth book, if you could, and when is it released? Secrets of the Construction Industry. And... It isn't a book that I have written. I mm -hmm. have collated it. I've written my first three. And I wanted to write my fourth book. And I said, I want to speak the truth because mm -hmm. I've realized, especially over the last few years, the industry has taken a huge step away from principles. And reality is built on principles alone. If we're not taking a principle-centric approach, then what is this reality that we're all trying to co-create? And the industry is an absolute mess on every single front. No matter where you look, no one's thriving. No one's really doing well. Statistics are going up. Funding's going up. But the same reality is being propagated and the same crappy posters are being put up on the wall. And all of this legislation and whatnot is just sugarcoating on what is fundamentally a flawed reality because there are no principles that are being spoken about. And not just that, but I don't know in your experience, but there are many sensitive souls in society who, if challenged, you know, I know you challenge people here in a respectful way, and that is so good because if challenging conversations cannot be brought back in and for me to assess my own thinking and for you to assess your own thinking, how are we going to evolve? So that was the mission of my fourth book. And I said, look, I can write this alone. But I know I have a big microphone and I want to give that to people who have learnt experience. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is embodiment. You have mm -hmm. taken the, you, the wisdom is within your body. You have actually lived it. And I have taken 31, my, 32 myself included, exemplary leaders, industry titans and young guns because experience matters not. The wisdom has nothing to do with timelines and ask them a signature question. What is one thing that you would tell a person? So imagine a person has no cells of recognition, no point of reference, and whilst I'm answering, I want you to answer that question as well. Mm -hmm. And I've collated an anthology of a principle-centric approach to the industry because you have gotten where you are today by principles, as has everyone else on your show. Well, I have the answer. What is your it's answer? very easy. What is it? Help more, help others more than you help yourself. If you help others succeed, that's your greatest success. Hence, host of the show, giving people the microphone, but knowing who to choose to give the microphone to. Because not all, even though the words are spoken, doesn't necessarily make them true. So you need to be very careful with who you surround yourself with, A, to who's on your team, but most importantly, who are your mentors, who are your supporters, who are your guided souls behind the scenes. So if I was to give that answer correctly, I would really consider who are your top five people that have the best five values that you want, that's who you need to go to first. Brilliant answer. And that is so underrated because those people, you're not just taking on their behaviours, you're taking on their whole belief system. And if that belief system fundamentally doesn't serve where you want to go, they're not your people. It's not just about their worldly success, which is important and it has its place but you're when you're aligning you're actually bringing the whole person into your reality and as you so aptly pointed out choosing who that is and there are exemplary people there are fantastic people doing great things instead of the tacticals or the the people who are not doing things they're not so kosher way let's put it that way and they exist so that's the essence of the fourth book Excellent. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you back as a guest and we're going to discuss um, your real estate business and the difference that you're making there in property. So thank you so much and we'll see you again soon. Let's do it.
Welcome to the new property show, Zed Nasheed, the name that's out there on the streets. Real estate, where'd you come from? Thank you for having me, Steve. I um, am 34 years old, and I think I'm, bit, I'm in between 33 and 34. I was just telling one of the boys here just before. <laughs> uh, I was born in Afghanistan, came to show when I was 12 years old. Yeah, I um, started selling hot dogs. I got into real estate when I was 21 years old. Come long story short. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, I remember your first deal. Uh, you talk about you walk along the street. How did you get your first client? It's a story there. When I was selling hot dogs, all I had to do was ask a question. Yep. And then I realized the power of asking a question. And not unless you ask a question, you just never know if you get the answer or not. So the person that asks the question is the person that gets a response. So I'm like, all right, this is easy. Maybe I could sell these hot dogs for $10. $10. I was meant to sell them for four bucks. So I ended up selling for $10 and $8, and I acted like a little innocent boy. I'm training <laughs> right now. Can you give me a tip as well? So I just asked a question. So then I, then I learned the power of asking a question. So then when I jumped into real estate, I was walking past uh, this bakery in, in uh, Hampton Park. It's the ghettos of southeastern Melbourne. <laughs> and uh, I saw this guy holding a piece of bread. And I'm like, I was so nervous to talk to this guy. I said, sir, you look great holding this bread. Would you have a property to sell? He said, oh, excuse me? I said, do you want to sell your house? <laughs> he goes, in fact, I just bought a house recently. You should come out and have a look at my property tomorrow afternoon. 4 p.m. the next day I show up, bam, the property's sold. It within 48 hours, 48 or 72 hours of launching the property. So that's when I knew that the person that actually asked the question is the person that wins in this life. So that's how I got my first listening. Now you've been uh, selling properties for a number of years now. Um, what are some of the best, some of the best years, or some of the best sales that you've had? Is there anything that's memorable uh, where you've made a difference to someone's life, or um, you've saved someone's life, or you've helped them purchase their dream property? Something well beyond their expectations. Being a salesman, I'll always tell you that every single transaction that I do is you know, one of the best transactions ever. Incredible. Reason being is because if somebody gives a key to their home, that's a key to their heart. So I treat every single transaction, even if it's worth $100 to $100 million to $10 million to a million bucks. So I treat every single transaction the same regardless of you know, who somebody is or who someone's profile is. Uh, but I think my mes most memorable sale was I was in Alwood Bakery and I listed this property in um, uh, Alwood, 37 Pine Avenue, and it was an off-market deal. The vendor said, vendor purchased something for, off me for just under $5 million, and he said, not unless you sell my house, you can't buy this five, we can't settle on this property. So then what I did was I went to a local cafe in Alwood and I overheard these two gentlemen talking about their, 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 their next investment venture. And I said, I'm so sorry, guys, you guys are talking. Again, the power of asking. Mm -hmm. I, I know I don't want to interview you guys whilst you're having breakfast, but I just heard you talking about investment properties. I've got an off-market deal. If you, come, if you can come out right now and I can short you straight after this and I can make you minimum, minimum $300,000. In the long run, not in the short <laughs> yeah, of run. Of course. <laughs> He's like, all right, I like this kid's energy. Within 48 hours, he shows up to my open home and I, I get a blank check for 2.75, which is $250,000 above market value, and I sold it. And I made a good $50,000 commission within, just by asking one question. So there you go, power of asking the question again, Steve. I think, too, one of the things that you've also treated your clients at over the years is, even with your answer before, is not transactional. Um, one of the keys why your clients keep coming back is relationships. Yeah. Um, I, I know you've flown up to Queensland before and they've been overseas with your clients, but what's some of the advice you would actually give people when, when I guess, a sales agent, when meeting a potential prospect for the first time? How do you build relationships? I know you've got a great energy, but how do you go beyond that? I don't do transactional. I do more no. transformational. Asking the question, acknowledging what the client says and then ask. There's a reason why as salespeople, or in general, we have two ears and one mouth. We mm -hmm. should listen twice and speak once. What happens the majority of the time when you're talking to a salesman, they just keep talking, blah, 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 and the clients say, my mum's name's you know, Georgina, and he's a salesman saying, what's your father's name? Okay, cool, no, it's, that's a nice name, so do you want to buy a house? They just <laughs> don't listen. Oh, Georgina's a very nice name. Where's Georgina from? Is that Greek? Is that Italian? Hola, como estas bien? Love That's it. how you build relationships. <laughs> yeah? Otherwise, you're just pitching and pitching, pitching, and you're just talking to a wall the whole time. This is when people feel that they don't like salespeople. Yeah? Well, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be sympathetic and listen to people. Excellent. Well, hearing, I did hear something. Guinness Book of Records. Yeah. What, what happened there? Man, I went on TV and uh, I sold a house within 15 minutes and every single TV launched the show. It's like, all right, world's <laughs> fastest selling estate agent. And then I applied for it and I never followed up, you know, with it myself, to be, to be quite honest. And then I said, from that day, I'll, I was the world's fastest selling estate agent. I would walk into a, people, you know, a house off market 
and I'll say, all right, 7 p.m. tomorrow night, you'll be sold. I'm so sorry I can't sell at 7 o'clock tonight because I've got other commitments. I <laughs> sold 28 houses in 30 days in one month, and, you know, it, and, and that was a record-breaking month for me. I would even, like, make a phone call saying, just buy this house, buy this house, buy this house, buy this house. So then I started to call myself the world's fastest selling estate agent, people just gave me that title. Excellent. Well, it's a, it's a worthy title. Now you've actually transformed, uh, transformed now into Queensland. Now you've broken into some new territory. Are you sitting down there in the Cavill Avenue? Of, uh, of you up in Surface Paradise, Broad Beach? Whereabouts are? Uh, where are you doing some transactions up in Queensland? We're based in Mermaid Beach. Yes. And uh, right behind Hages Avenue. Mm -hmm. Hages Avenue is more like the Golden Mile of Brighton. Mm -hmm. We're talking ten thousand dollars a square meter. Um, and um, Mermaid Beach. I feel like Gold Coast is so relaxed. The market mm. there. When I went there. You know, especially the last two years, so much money got pumped out of Melbourne because Melbourne had the longest lockdown mm. in the world. So every single person, that every client of mine that I was talking to, they were just buying in Gold Coast. Because you can get a waterfront home for like yeah. $1.8 million. For $1.8 million, you can't buy anything in Melbourne. The reality is you don't even get water views unless you have a good, I'm talking $10 million. Even at $10 million, you still don't get proper water views, depending on how far you can go out to. That's a renovator. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but now the Gold Coast market, I realised one thing with Gold Coast market was people recover from the weekends yeah. on Mondays, they get to work on Tuesday, and things start to slow <laughs> down on Wednesday, it's almost yeah. finished, and Thursdays things start to slow down, and then Friday at 12 o'clock, be a time. How do you find the hustle, like you've, in Melbourne, you, you're all known for your energy, how do, you, how do you adapt your selling style in Queensland? I think... Regardless of wherever I am, I yep. would never change my attitude towards life, that positive mm -hmm. energy, because the energy you put out is the energy you receive. Last week I was in Gold Coast and I was talking to one of the biggest developers in um, Gold Coast and he said, you guys need to calm down, you need to earn your energy, you know, turn your energy down, we're, we're based in Queensland. I said, just because you said that, I'm turning it up two voltages. <laughs> yeah. So yep. the reality is... I, I did an appraisal yesterday, you know, the house was worth $12 million. Then I didn't I didn't know it was for $7 million. And I, every time I'm in these houses, I ask one simple question to all these people. What does success mean to you? Some people say family, some people say happiness, uh, some people say money. And one of the most interesting things yesterday was, he said time. Time is your best friend and it's also your worst enemy. Like, that's something that we literally can't buy. The clock's always ticking. Exactly. And I deal with so many people out there, they, they focus on building generational wealth. Stop worrying about the future. Start living today. You weren't born to just work. You were born to live. So be passionate about the field that you're in and just invest money in real estate. Like, you look at the interest rates right now, Steve, 9%. Well, I was paying that 9%, 10% 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It only went down because we're in, the, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The day you're born, there's a risk. The day you get married, there's a risk. The day you have a kid, there's a risk. You don't know if it's going to come out healthy or not. There's risk all around us. Calculate your risk because God doesn't make land anymore. Correct. And hey, we, we heard on another episode, best investment you can make is earth. And I think it would be fantastic to show some of our viewers uh, and demonstrate some of the properties you've actually got up in this, these Hedges Avenue and give our Melbourne market a bit of a taste of what you're doing. Uh, I want to thank you for today, and we're going to get you back on another episode. We're going to talk about brand uh, and really what it can do, and attention, attention, attention. So, Zed and Sheet, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Steve. And what about, I guess, with the buying side of it, Mark? So you would have seen the, the cost of, or well, you're in new construction. Yeah. Um, so rooming houses as such. Yep. Um, but. How does that work with land prices getting so expensive and, and I guess, um, council? Look, it's been yeah. interesting, and there's certainly yeah. been a big jump in land prices in the last couple of years, um, which has been interesting to watch, and there's been some opportunities created out of that for some people. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think in most of the time, like, I'm not dealing with first home buyers. It's mm -hmm. mostly investors, so they are coming with some cash or equity um, to bring to the table. So a lot of the time it's just, you know, working with the brokers and so forth to see, you know, where they can get the borrowing to. And you mentioned before about structuring. I mean, that definitely helps a lot too. Like we're doing a lot of stuff with discretionary trusts actually mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Um, yeah, in order to, I suppose, separate you know, the serviceability issue out. Um, because if you group too much together, you, know, you run into um, you know, the, the um, income ratio you know, limits. What do they, they call it? Uh, <laughs> debt to income ratio. Debt to income DTI, ratio. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you run into limits with that where you can you know, separate that out um, by separating it into different structures. So we are seeing that a fair bit in the investor space as well. What about you, Dan? What do you think of trusts and, uh, and setting up companies? Um, so if you and Mark were talking together, 
would you uh, would you agree? Yeah, well, the, uh, yeah. the the third the third person in that conversation would be an accountant. So, yeah, definitely. So so our our role as a financial planner with the client is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> understanding their broader long-term goals and where property investment as a strategy fits in, mm -hmm. we'll then work in, in, in conjunction with their accountant in terms of optimising mm -hmm. the right structures for those investments. But absolutely, to, to, to Mark's point, um, that's, that's uh, trusts, particularly discretionary trusts and the flexibility that those trusts offer are, are an important cog in, in certain situations for, for clients that have that specific need. I think what we hear then too is there's still always opportunity, but you really need the right people on your team mm. uh, and creating that. And as I said, there's an opportunity there, as I said, where you can go, sometimes financial planners, brokers, real estate agents, they can kill deals. <laughs> um, but I think if you have the buyer's interests at heart, um, that'd be it. And one, one more question there for you. So in terms of the uh, advice that you give and, and all financial planners are different, um, what would be your ratio of real estate um, to stock or an mm. alternative uh, like that? So the balanced portfolio, uh, because ideally I'd love to lean towards real estate, I want to hear 100%, <laughs> but um, sometimes you're going to be going and, and balancing that out. So if you had 100% and you're on average, what are your clients investing in? Look, re really good question because I think historically our industry and, and perhaps the perception of financial planners in general is mm -hmm. Everything's got to be on a platform. We can charge an ongoing advice fee yeah. around that. So property's always been this nebulous thing on mm -hmm. the side. Everyone's got it, mm -hmm. but the industry as a whole didn't traditionally focus on it. I'm not saying I'm Robinson Crusoe in the regard mm -hmm. that a, as a planner focused on building wealth through property, but mm -hmm. it's <clears throat> it certainly hasn't been the norm throughout sort of the history of our industry. I'd say to answer your question, um, outside of super, mm -hmm. I'd say it's the bulk of what we what we do um, is is buy is help clients buy direct property and build wealth that way. I'd say also drilling into that that's for people who are on the journey of of getting to independent wealth. We see building wealth through residential property as the most efficient way to achieve that. Once you get to that point, that's where diversification, I mean, diversification within a property portfolio is mm -hmm. important, but diversification within asset classes becomes very relevant you know, when you've got that pool of money where lifestyles are funded. When, to answer your question about shares, primarily we do that through superannuation. We, you know, the benefits of franking credits are, are, are quite high on, the, on a low tax rate. Um, it's also a much longer term strategy in that for particularly for most people, you know, it's 20, 30 years away, um, you know, when, when, when you're starting out on that. What you're saying there, Dane, is that a lot of your clients now are investing in, um, so you're using super to invest predominantly in, uh, in stocks and a primary vehicle as, in, as unless you're getting diversification would be going back into bricks and mortar. Yeah. Um, and as they grow, um, then talking about diversification. So diversification. Now, what does that word mean? What does it, it means a, a range of different things to different people. And, and I guess the old Buffett quote of um, you want to you, you want to be diversified, but you don't want to diversify. So it's mm -hmm. not you're not you're not sort of diversifying for the sake of it. It's it's, it's it comes back to what the goals that you're trying to achieve are and what the optimal strategy is to achieve that goal. So if I come back to the point of building wealth to a point where mm -hmm. work becomes optional, we see b b doing so through residential property as the right strategy for that goal. Excellent. Great point. So uh, last question, really quick. Uh, why should you sell property? When, when we, we advise to, to, uh, to purchase it and hold and retain, uh, what would be your main reason to sell? Um, because we all know that at the end of the day, property goes up and accumulates in value. Why are we selling it? Um, look, my view on that is it's opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. Like if you've got equity tied up there that you, know, you can't access and you're not getting a great return on that equity and you can get better return elsewhere, then that's where you would sell to roll it into something else. So reinvesting. I mean, yeah, not, mm. not, you know, not sell it and go on a European holiday. Mm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Roll it into something that gets you better cash flow and a better return on equity and maybe you can roll it into a couple of properties because there might be a chunk of equity there you're struggling to access. And it could also be, like I sort of had this question for both Kian and Dane, um, around the structuring. Like, how important is it to get that structuring right early on um, to make sure you can do things? And you might have properties, you might have a number of properties in individual names, and that might be hampering your serviceability. So it could be worth 
turning that over, rolling the cash into other structures and purchase. Would that be right? Yeah. Yes, sir, you go. You go. <laughs> yeah, you go I'd say like just, just directly from what I do, uh, many people had the, 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 or don't have the, the advice at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And a few years later down the track, they, uh, they, they, they must exit and their only option is to sell one or all of their properties because uh, I can't refinance the debt because they bought a couple of like large amount of like three million dollars worth of commercial commercial properties under their personal name. It, it's all uh, you know a negative, uh, uh, positively geared, mm. but I can't do it because it's under their personal names and they are travelers and investors, kind of yep. semi semi retired, so they get a, an exit letter by the business bank and also this is a point. Uh, in Australia, you're so protected when you get a home loan. The bank cannot really exit you unless you've done something wrong and, and, and default <coughs> on the contract. In commercial lending, it can be uh, more risky. So your, your contracts are of a shorter term um, and, and you really need the right advice. Talk to your accountant, uh, you know, financial advisor uh, and your broker at least. Yeah, I, I guess with us, there's no hard and fast rule. It is case by case, but I'd say I do typically err on the side of simplicity for people when they're starting out, that you, know, you bring in structures for certain purposes. And I, I, I totally agree that, that it's, it's, a, it's that sort of it's trying to strike that balance between what's optimal and what's manageable day one and what's going to be most efficient or most optimal sort of 10, 20 years down the track when you're starting to make changes to your portfolio. And I think the other key part of that with trusts is, particularly for small business owners, that the, the asset protection that, that, that that offers. As a salary earner, it's probably less relevant um, from an asset protection perspective anyway, but certainly from a tax efficiency perspective, from a borrowing capacity perspective, it can have its merits. Excellent. So are you a seller? Would you sell, do you suggest selling property and, and what reason? Yeah, I, I echo Mark's point, mm -hmm. the, the opportunity cost, um, I'd say, again, it's a, property is a long-term mm -hmm. investment strategy, but certainly the, the market cycles are different in Melbourne than they are in Sydney to where they are in Perth to Adelaide, et cetera. So it's really striking that balance between optimising the, the return on mm -hmm. the investment and not chopping and changing because there's high transaction costs, as we know, in, 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 in property versus making sure that you are having your portfolio optimised for where the best opportunities are um, over the long haul. The you thing like, yeah. The thing I like to add about that is that many people, mum and dad investors, let's call them, buy a property and they think they're a property investor. Mm -hmm. And one property does not make a portfolio. And a portfolio is what makes you wealthy. So for some people, it might be sell the one property they've bought Mm -hmm. to, to then spread it across other purchases that will start to build them a portfolio that will provide them with the wealth over time. Great answer. Mm. Yourself, Ken, S selling? What would uh, you sell and what reason should you sell? I, I have only sold uh, my property uh, once, if mm -hmm. you're talking about like a residential mm -hmm. place, and yes, it's to roll over to another purchase. So I I'm, think, I'm not um, so much a seller. Great, great points, and I think the, the ultimate goal should be whatever funds the lifestyle the best. So mm. minimises um, your outgoing expenses and increases your incoming. So I think your portfolio typically should be leaning towards positive geared properties with some capital growth mixed in there. And I think the only other reason you should sell is if the cost of owning that property far outweighs the benefit. So um, cost of repairs, the depreciation schedules disappeared mm. and we can't develop it, we can't renovate it, mm. we can't do anything else, the property's then expired. Um, I think you just leave it and you move on to a, to a new opportunity. So I think um, in, your, in your theory here, buy as many as you can, diversification, um, and make sure you've got the right structures and the right people on your team. Guys, really great debate. Uh, look forward to see you again soon on the new property show. Thanks, Thanks for having Thank you. Us. That's all for this week. Thank you for joining us. If you want to see the full interviews, check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv. We will see you again next week.